On behalf of the History Department and Ball State University, may I welcome you tonight to the first annual Sir Norman Angel Lecture. A few years ago, Sir Norman gave to Ball State University his collection of papers and books, and we are momentarily anticipating the final shipment of those books to us. I might say that in the past few years, we have been carefully cataloging those documents so that they may be used by students and scholars from all over the world that care to use them. I have a distinguished guest that I would like to present to you tonight. Uh, we are honored to have the British Consul General from Chicago with us, Mr. John Roby. Would you stand, Mr. Roby? The next order of business is to present an individual to you that needs no introduction, who will in turn present our distinguished and honored guest this evening, the speaker. It is my privilege to present to you a professor of history, the vice president for instructional affairs and dean of the faculties, Dean Burkhart. Dean Burkhart. Thank you very much, Dr. Farrell. It's a privilege to be a part of this program this evening to welcome so many of you to the first Sir Norman Angel Lecture. It was on the 13th of April in the little theater just directly behind us in 1966 that we had the privilege and pleasure of bestowing an honorary degree on Sir Norman Angel. As has already been mentioned, uh, we'd had the privilege of receiving his uh, library or portions of it. Friends of the university, uh, Dr. Howard Wilson, then of the University of California, now deceased, and Edgar Wesley of Stanford University, who had met Sir Norman in England, talked with him about the desirability of placing his library in an institution that would value it an institution that was concerned about teaching, an institution that was interested in international affairs. Since uh, Mr. Wesley particularly had been a visiting professor at Ball State, it was possible for him to make arrangements with Robert La Follette, then head of the Social Science Department. And one thing led to another. Friends in, of the university here in Muncie made it possible for negotiations to be undertaken, and the books came to Ball State. It was a very happy day, and some of you who have access to the Ball State News will uh, enjoy, I'm sure, looking back into the issues of 1961 to see in the foyer of the library a crate almost as large as the foyer itself, which had come to Muncie, Indiana, through the courtesy of the consul uh, and uh, the Railway Express. And there, Dr. Farrell and President Emmons and Grady and some others were gathered, opening, the, opening this large crate of Sir Norman's papers. Since that time, at least two gentlemen have uh, earned their doctorates by studying and arranging the data that's available in Sir Norman Angel's papers, and there must be uh, two or three more who are currently in the process of attaining that distinguished degree that's necessary for one to be a college professor studying history and international relations. When Sir Norman was here two years ago, uh, we talked about the desirability of establishing a Sir Norman Angel lecture. We're very proud to be able to present what we believe will be the first in a long series of Sir Norman Angel lectures. So this evening, we have the good fortune to hear Lord Gladwin uh, from the British Isles. You'll know from your program and from what you read in the newspapers about him before that he's retired from the Foreign Service uh, following a distinguished career, which he served um, in among many posts as the permanent United Kingdom representative to the United Nations from 1950 to 1954, and as ambassador to France from 1954 to 1960. 
Although officially retired from this particular post, he continues to be active in international affairs. He's chairman of Britain and Europe, vice president of the Atlantic Treaty Association, vice president of the Board of Governors of the Atlantic Institute, and a host of other honors which I will not attempt to recite at this time. Gladwin Jebb was born in 1900, educated at Eton and at Magdalen College in Oxford. He entered the forest, Foreign Service in 1924 and has had a distinguished career in many different posts since that time. Among the international conferences, which would ring a familiar note with American audiences, uh, were the conferences at Dumbarton Oaks and at San Francisco. He took up his appointment as permanent United Kingdom representative to the United Nations just two days after the outbreak of the Korean War, and in the difficult years that followed, he won a distinguished reputation for his skill in debate, both in the Security Council and in the General Assembly. He's published, as uh, Sir Norman Angel has, widely in the field of uh, international affairs, and for his publication, for his work as a diplomat and a statesman, he's received honorary degrees not only from Oxford, his own university in England, but from Syracuse University here in the United States. Lord Gladwin, we're most happy and proud to have you with us here this evening, sir. Well, Mr. Dean and ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, really very happy and uh, honored to address this great gathering in the Ball State University of Indiana in this wonderful university which I toured around before dinner and I must say above all I congratulate you on the extraordinary beauty of your new buildings and on the uh, spirit which animates this university as far as I've been able to perceive it and appreciate it in the few hours that I've been here. And I also am very honored to make a, a sort of semi-political speech in uh, commemoration of the great Sir Norman Angel in this state of Indiana, in the middle of the United States, where one has uh, vaguely the impression that um, America begins somehow to make up its collective mind. And um, I shall um, speak for about uh, three quarters of an hour, and then I understand that we're going to have a question period, which no doubt will be much more fun than you listening to me making this address. Uh, at any rate, I hope that if anything occurs to you, as a result of my remarks, you won't hesitate to say it, and when we'll have a little debate at the end of what I say. Now, ladies and gentlemen, anyone who, who reads the works, the various works of that great Englishman, Norman Angel, and I expect that some of you have. Any, may, um, anybody who does so, I think, must admit that in, in, the, in the light of our frightful experiences, uh, since he formulated it, his central thesis was demonstrably true. War, in other words, uh, does not result in any advantage for anybody. It is something which as such degrades the human race and it could and should be prevented, if possible, by organized international action. That is more or less the message which he communicated from right before the First World War. Uh, he was not, as you know, he was not a pacifist and he did not say as he was often accused of saying, that um, war was impossible. He merely denounced it as useless, as dangerous, and as essentially counterproductive. And his views after the First World War were, uh, as you all know, of course, largely incorporated in the League of Nations. And in the 30s, he watched with them um, agonized impotence, the uh, rather passive acceptance of the destruction of this machine 
by its very creators and supporters, pointing out how yielding to the Japanese over China in the early 30s would be bound, as he saw it, uh, to encourage other flagrant violations of the covenant of the League of Nations, as it duly did in 1935, when Mussolini uh, invaded Ethiopia, uh, and in the following year, when Hitler tore up the Treaty of Locarno and occupied the demilitarized Rhineland. Just before the Second World War, he was busy pointing out that war could still be prevented if only the Western European democracies could make uh, some arrangement with Russia and America, but that otherwise they were doomed. No use. War once again swept over the world. And once again, the victorious nations provided themselves with um, an international organization to prevent it. Now, is this inevitably going to go the way of its predecessor? Is blind nationalism, the old game of beggar my neighbor, once again to be the only real motive force in international affairs? Must we accept the simple rule, the ancient plan, that he will take who has the power and he will keep who can? Is peace possible? Well, that's the subject of my present lecture. But first, um, what do we mean by peace? Well, I suppose we may say that um, a country is in a state of peace when its inhabitants are not engaged in killing one another or the inhabitants of another country in any organized fashion or on any extensive scale. You will observe, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, such a definition would not make a state of war dependent on its declaration. Indeed, any declaration of war has, uh, since Pearl Harbor, apparently gone quite out of fashion. I can hardly recall a single instance after 1941. Perhaps you can, but I haven't been able to recall any. Though there have been wars in plenty since the end of World War II, about 24, I rather think, uh, which would more or less qualify as war under my definition of peace as I've just given it. Nobody would deny, I suppose, that the United States, for instance, is now effectively at war with North Vietnam. Nobody talks of anything except the war in Vietnam. Uh, one can very well argue about the responsibility for this war and maintain, as I do, that it was not the Americans, of course, who started it. Uh, the only point I am here making is that peace exists in the, uh, uh, the, the point that I'm contesting, which I think is wrong, is the idea that peace exists in the absence of declared war. Of course it doesn't. It's obviously not so. But equally, under the definition I've just given, the United States, therefore, could be said to be at peace with North Korea, and this in spite of recent rather warlike events. Armistices, in fact, seem to have largely taken the place of the old peace treaties in our modern so-called civilization. But can peace, however you define it, really be said to exist in conditions of what is now always referred to as Cold War? Supposing that country A is trying by all means in its power, short of the use of armed force, uh, to undermine the government of country B, can the strained relations resulting from this effort be described as peaceful? Clearly not, in the ordinary sense of the word, more especially if there are no diplomatic relations, as in the case of the American relationship with, shall we say, China or Cuba. But for the purposes of my present lecture, I shall assume that America is, uh, in fact, and for the moment, 
at peace, quote unquote, with these states, with China and Cuba, just as Britain is at peace with Rhodesia, shall we say. Egypt is at peace with Israel, uh, or uh, indeed India is at peace with Pakistan. Perhaps we must even accept uh, that, um, we must even accept such strange relations or non-existent relations between states as a sort of uh, part of our modern life. And indeed, on any realistic estimate of the future, we shall probably have to accept this for a long period of time. Is it still possible, however, is it still possible to think of preserving or arriving at peace in the sense of my definition? Well, let's see what the chances are. The main feature of the present rather bleak international landscape is undoubtedly the so-called balance of terror, in accordance of which neither of the superpowers, let's say Russia and America, neither of the superpowers is able to undertake what is called a first strike against the other without itself suffering quite unacceptable casualties as a result. What is the point of knocking out your adversary altogether if you yourself incur damage which will cripple you for generations? It doesn't need Sir Norman Angel to persuade us that such action would be entirely mad. There is an obvious possibility, nevertheless, that if the superpowers are involved in any hostilities of any kind, whether directly when their armed forces confront each other, let's say directly when the two forces are face to face, um, or indirectly as a result of protecting some minor ally from defeat, a nuclear exchange may come about or could come about by the very force of things and indeed uh, by the very existence of quite small so-called tactical nuclear weapons. This is usually referred to, of course, as escalation. So the balance of terror necessarily imposes great caution on both the superpowers and thus it tends to result in the maintenance of a territorial status quo, preserving the situation as it now is, neither side being able to contemplate the complete defeat of a protégé without serious alarm, and at the same time not being able to use a protégé as a sort of pawn uh, wherewith to develop a serious threat against the adversary's king. And if Cuba did not prove this, then it did not prove anything. Thus, the, the balance of terror, undoubtedly, is a major factor in the preservation of peace under our definition, as I think. And there's every reason to suppose that without it, let's say if it didn't exist, any one of the 20 or 30 recent wars, which I have mentioned, might have been extended and generalized into a third world war long before this. Indeed, I believe myself that it would have been certain. Now, in theory, and I suggest largely in practice, the balance of terror will endure until, well, unless one side or the other believes that it has either achieved a very large measure of immunity from nuclear attack, owing to the successful development of some ABM, anti-ballistic missile system, or that it has produced a super weapon which will render a second strike virtually inoperative, or both. And even in such an event or events, it might then, even then it might hesitate uh, to provoke a nuclear conflict, for who knows what the ultimate effect of fallout might be on it, if it did so, and say nothing on the rest of the world. Other things being equal, therefore, it seems likely that the two existing superpowers will avoid a nuclear conflict. But, you may say, will the emergence of China as a considerable nuclear power, or indeed of France, will uh, the emergence of these powers as nuclear powers 
will they upset the balance of terror? Well, I doubt it very much. Whatever their progress, neither of these countries will, for many years, have a nuclear force which is, as they say, credible, in the sense that um, if it were used as a bargaining counter to achieve national aims, it could not, in the last resort, be disregarded. In other words, the bluff could be called by one of the existing superpowers, or possibly indeed by both. This is likely to increase, rather than decrease in probability, as the anti-ballistic missile systems of the superpowers render them largely immune from medium power attack. And even if this, this were not so, and neither of the two newly nuclearized powers or both came near to the point at which they could inflict unacceptable damage to the two existing superpowers, they would probably, even in those circumstances, they would probably be bound by the same inflexible law as that imposed by the present balance of terror. Also, I think. The same, of course, obviously applies to the United Kingdom, and it would no doubt apply to any European force that might emerge if ever there were a united Europe. In other words, if um, a diffusion, as they say, if diffusion of um, nuclear weapons is limited to a few larger powers, it is not likely to be very dangerous. Only if one or two weapons get into the hands of smaller and uh, irresponsible and uh, above all divided or unsatisfied powers, is there, would there be likely to be a real danger. And that is why, of course, the proposed non-proliferation treaty is so important. The Romans used to say that those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first made mad. But if there is no such intervention of providence, as it were, and uh, the rulers of the larger states remain comparatively sane, which is perhaps a rather large assumption, we oughtn't to lose too much sleep by worrying about the prospects of general nuclear war. But, uh, so far as the peace of our definition is concerned, there does remain a paradox. Although the two existing superpowers are by far the most powerful nations in the world, they find it very difficult, owing to the very operation of the balance of terror, to impose their will on third parties. And such third parties are often, I'm afraid, naturally bellicose. Their governments may be under extreme pressure. Their economic situation may be disastrous. The local dictator may wish to maintain himself in power by acquiring glory. Or uh, some vast increase in the population may make it seem inevitable to them that they should expand. All life, certainly all international life, is a struggle. The poorer the nation, the greater the struggle. There is an obvious gap between the developed and uh, presumably satisfied and, and the underdeveloped and uh, consequently unsatisfied powers. Even within the two alliance systems of the industrialized countries, the embarrassed of superpowers, as we know, can no longer, as it were, keep order. France in the West and Romania in the East pursue, frankly, anti-leader policies. But whatever may be thought of, the, of these heresies, as it were, they are not likely to produce wars or indeed to disturb the kind of peace which I have defined. For neither France nor Romania has the power to do any such thing, at any rate for the moment. Not so in the so-called third world of the developing countries. Here we are in areas in which uh, the two superpowers are not in immediate physical contact and in which the game of the balance of terror must be conducted through third parties who are certainly not always amenable to reason. Thus, in the Middle East, for instance, it is probable that some kind of unacknowledged joint pressure may eventually be applied by both the superpowers 
on their respective protégés so as to uh, induce the Israelis to withdraw from at any rate the greater part of their occupied territory in return for guarantees about shipping, border incidents, frontier guarantees and so on. Indeed, were it not, I, I'm afraid, for the war in Vietnam, which is distracting, of course, American attention to a very large extent, I personally believe that such pressure would have been applied on both sides long before now. For a renewal of hostilities would once again raise the spectre of some clash between the navies in the area of the two protectors of one side or the other. And this must at all costs be prevented for evident reasons of state. Such pressure, as I've indicated, may not be successful. Indeed, there is some reason to suppose that the ability of the superpowers to restrain their protégés may well be less than it was. But if so, then it will probably result in the long run in, in an increase in the so-called, as Kipling said, I think, the so-called ties of common funk. And besides, um, however mutinous they may be, the protégés will surely think many times before actually breaking with their respective protectors. Equally in Vietnam, and here I'm approaching debatable ground, but I think it's true. Equally in Vietnam, whatever the present passions may be, it is the relationship between the superpowers, which as I see it in the long run, is the deciding factor. Just as it was in Geneva in 1954, when Anthony Eden used his great expertise as a mediator to achieve what was, alas, uh, only a temporary settlement. There is, in fact, a sort of logic in this terrible conflict which must impose itself in the course of time. Precisely the same situation, or very nearly the same situation, shall I say, occurred in Korea in 1950-53. Here was a country likewise divided into two quite unnatural halves. As in Vietnam, the northern half decided to apply force in order, as it were, to assist nature, it being in their view unnatural. But it, and uh, perhaps by mistake the Russians, ignored the rules of the game. And after a desperate struggle, the unnatural situation was more or less restored in accordance with the requirements of the balance of terror. What would uh, again have put that balance into jeopardy would have been if General MacArthur had had his way and if Korea had been unified by the use or threat of atomic bombs on the Yalu or beyond. As I see it, much the same considerations apply as regards the possible unification of all Vietnam and the destruction of the communist regime at Hanoi. And I have no doubt that in the long run the same conclusions will be drawn. If nuclear weapons, even tactical nuclear weapons, are employed by one side, they could well be employed by the other. So in practice, unless South Vietnam is defended by conventional means only, it is unlikely to be defended at all. For together, presumably with North Vietnam, it would have ceased to exist. No doubt there would be an end to the war, uh, but only, to quote the Romans again, if you make a solitude and call it peace. The application of which principle on a worldwide scale would presumably involve the extinction of humanity. Happily, there is, as I have said, a considerable reason to suppose that doom is not inevitable that the last judgment, so to speak, is not really much more likely to come about in the year 2000 AD than it was in the year 1000 AD, when it was commonly supposed, you may remember, that the end of the world was at hand. We are, it is true, all undergoing a revolutionary change. We can't help that. And there are admittedly grave dangers to our social systems if uh, small or medium say nothing of civil wars, continue to trouble us. What then is the best line for us in the Western world? 
who after all do share the same civilization, what is the best line for us to take if we are to direct revolutionary urges into comparatively peaceful channels? I think at this point it is useful to reflect that um, some wars will probably always be with us. Life, I repeat, is a struggle. And in all foreseeable circumstances, there will no doubt be some men who will prefer to die rather than to accept something which they consider iniquitous or which places them, as they believe, in a position of absolute subjection. For so long, too, as the world is divided up into a number of absolutely independent and sovereign nation-states, there will always be a risk of wars of some sort. Unless these nations, these nation-states, accept some kind of authority, this is indeed inevitable. So, we approach the question, what kind of authority is required? And how can it possibly exercise its authority? As I believe, and um, I have had some experience of both organizations, both the League of Nations and the United Nations uh, suffered, or have suffered, from the same built-in defect. No real provision was made for the effective limitation of the ultimate power of independent action on the part of the component nation-states. It is true that in the case of the League of Nations, resolute action on the part of the leading members, as the Norman Angel suggested, namely Britain and France, such action might possibly have nipped aggression by Japan, Italy and Germany in the bud. But the League was after all a very limited affair, not including America, and for most of the time not including Russia and Germany. And in any case, as you know, any member could withdraw. Nor was there any provision for majority voting. The United Nations was, in theory at any rate, an improvement. In that it was from the start nearly universal, and there was provision for majority voting in the Security Council, there is. Though not, as we all know, as regards the vital chapter 7 concerning the application of force. But the point I want to make is that there can be no international body which can in all circumstances compel nation states to do what they do not want to do unless it is definitely supranational. In other words, uh, unless it is something which actually comprises the nation states, and sets up the equivalent of international ministries pursuing agreed common policies. Now, clearly, such a machine was impossible in 1919, and indeed in 1945. And, as I see it, it would, unfortunately, be quite impossible now. So, something like the United Nations is all that we can hope for at the moment in the way of a world organization uh, for many years to come. It is useful as a forum. If there's a measure of agreement between the superpowers, it could very well organize some kind of peacekeeping force when required. In certain special cases, it may even be capable of this in the absence of such agreement. But we are deluding ourselves if we think that it is in itself likely to play any very decisive role. I repeat, it is only, in essence, a collection of still sovereign and independent nation-states. The problem is, how do we best assist the process of peace under our definition in the continued presence of these nation-states? Well, first, no doubt, as I've said, we ought to do this by developing the unwritten rules of the balance of terror. But for these to be developed, there must certainly be an end of the war in Vietnam, and there must be no new war in Korea either. We may also, no doubt, have to wait ratification of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But in this general direction, as I see it, lies a very great, and indeed, as I think, the major hope. But the problem of the uncontrolled minor or medium nation-states remains. 
even if handled in the light of some tacit agreement between the superpowers, any serious war between such states may have serious consequences. How do we best limit such struggles, or even prevent some of them breaking out? Now, one good way, of course, would be to encourage any merger or virtual merger of sovereignty, which would reduce the number of nation states, and thus lessen the um, number of potential causes of discord. It's quite true that such mergers are at present unlikely among the so-called emergent states. The various federations which we British attempted to construct as part of our retreat from empire, as it's been called, all have collapsed. There is no Egyptian Sudanese, or indeed uh, no Arab Union. There is no continuing Raj in the whole Indian subcontinent. No federation in South Arabia, Rhodesia, East Africa, or the West Indies. Malaysia has now lost Singapore. Even the show piece, Nigeria, seems to be breaking up. Nor have the French had much better luck in this, in this direction. There is no united Maghreb, that's to say uh, Algeria, Tunisia and Morocco. No central direction of the old uh, Afrique Occidentale Française, capital in Dakar, or the Afrique Equatoriale Française, uh, to the south of it, capital Brazzaville. Everywhere, in the states which shook off colonial tutelage, the forces of nationalism seem, for the time being, to have won, at any rate temporarily. Even in those states which were formed not more than, uh, say, 50 or 60 years ago, as a result of bargains between the colonial powers and whose boundaries are simple lines on the map, uh, drawn up quite regardless of uh, ethnographic, or religious, or even economic considerations. Now, why is this? Probably because uh, there just are not enough indigenous or native officials capable of making anything work other than the administrative machine which the successor state inherited. And quite often, of course, not even that. Also because, as in the case of the Indian Raj, there were religious and historical reasons why unity could not be preserved in the absence of some alien central authority. Just as there were racial reasons for such a division in Malaysia. But as things settled down, after the tremendous upheaval of the Second World War and the decolonization, it is, as I think, probable that larger units will nevertheless emerge and we should naturally, I say we, let's say the industrialized powers of the West, uh, we should ne naturally encourage their emergence. There is, however, one area in which there is a real chance of harnessing the nation-state and creating, out of anarchy or potential anarchy, a force for peace which would make or could make its influence felt right over the world. And this is the crucial area of Europe. Crucial because it is also the area in which the friction necessary to spark off another world war might still possibly occur. Crucial also because the extraordinary concept of what's called the community, the European community, a totally new and a fruitful form of international association, is now in grave danger, owing chiefly, I'm afraid, to the nationalistic activities of General de Gaulle. Let us assume, however, that by one means or another, this wrecking is overcome, that Britain joins the community, at any rate within the next few years, and without Britain's balancing wheel there is no doubt that it cannot progress, and that fairly soon thereafter there is established some kind of political community, employing the same techniques which are employed, or would be employed if it was not for the general, under the Treaty of Rome. Why, why should this development be a force for peace, in the sense of an instrument which might uh, discourage or, or limit the outbreak of minor wars, but above all preserve 
that political balance on which, as we have seen, avoidance of a disastrous nuclear exchange mainly depends. Well, the problem of Europe, as we all know, is the problem of Germany. If Germany is divided, there is tension. If Germany is united, the problem is to know what exactly should be united and how the old urge for domination could be avoided or possibly diverted. The Russians, who have suffered more than any other country at the hands of the Germans, may well believe that the best thing is for Germany to be divided forever. But it is possible that they might be persuaded to agree to some kind of association of all the present Germanys within the framework of a greater European whole. Supposing that we are eventually successful in creating some political and defence community in Western Europe, it might indeed be possible, I think it would be possible, to arrive at a point at which both the American and the Russian forces could be withdrawn to their own countries and friendly economic relations established between a Western Europe, which would remain in close contact with the United States, and an Eastern Europe in close contact with the Soviet Union. This general concept was one which I myself formulated in 1966 at a roundtable conference in Hamburg, and I was very glad to see that it has now been much more brilliantly presented by your Professor Zbigniew Brzezinski in the last number of Foreign Affairs, which I urge you to read if you have the time. January is thank you. If it could be achieved, there is no doubt that what has been called a climate of peace could radiate outwards from Europe over the entire Northern Hemisphere from Fairbanks, Alaska, eastwards right round to Vladivostok. But to achieve it, two things are indispensable. The Western European community must first be formed on supranational lines, and Britain must be an integral part of it. For if it remains a collection of independent states, it can only function as a result of one member imposing its leadership, or hegemony, or whatever you call it, while if it only consists of the six, it will neither be large enough, nor will it overcome the basic suspicion of the Teuton for the Gaul and the Gaul for the Teuton. Only if Britain comes in as an equal with the other two major states, can there be any hope of enlisting the aid of those among the young of those countries in Europe who long for some kind of new deal and thus defuse the dangerous element of nationalism. But here we come up against, uh, of course, we come up against the policy of the present ruler of France. It is a mistake to think that if the goal were removed tomorrow, there would not be enduring opposition in France to uh, both the provisos for European unity, which I have outlined. That is to say that it should be supranational and it should include Britain. Fear of merging France in some greater hole in which she would be swamped or could be swamped by the Germans is real and even undisguised. Jealousy of Britain is perhaps more widespread still. But as against this, there is, there is a real uneasiness about where the anti-American and pro-Russian policy of the general is leading that country and concern lest his hatred of supranationalism should result as it must result, if it is successful, in eventual industrial satellization of all the Western European lands, including France. Moreover, there is little doubt that de Gaulle's declared intention to found the equivalent of a third French empire must eventually be resisted by the Germans, and that when and if they do resist, he will, for internal political reasons, find it no longer possible to prevent the entry of Britain into the European economic community. Threats that if pressed by the Germans he will take France right out of the community or recognize the German Democratic Republic are both bluff. He could do neither of these things without the most serious internal consequences. On a basis of probabilities, therefore, we must assume that before many years have passed, some kind of European or Western European entity or body will actually have been formed. But what then? Are we to contemplate some kind of third force and the total disruption of the Atlantic Alliance? Not if Britain is a member of the community. And that is, of course, an additional reason why de Gaulle will not have us in 
for so long he's in a position to keep us out. But on the assumption that there is one day a workable Europe or Western Europe, how should we organize the famous partnership between it and the United States? Supposing it is formed, how can we get a partnership with you? I have myself always um, envisaged this as a kind of dialogue in a reformed and streamlined NATO council between what might be described as the two pillars of the Western world, let's say North America and Europe, in the presence of the minor allies, namely Portugal, Turkey, Greece and Iceland, who will, however, undoubtedly all be associated with the European Economic Community. They'll be associated with it, not members of it. For their part, the Canadians, who would be in a special position, might often, as I think, provide a chairman in this new machine. And in this way, the members of the European Community would first get together and try to achieve a common view on the great questions of the day, and then appoint a spokesman who would be responsible for trying to reconcile this view with that of the United States. It is possible that such a system could only be brought into operation gradually, of course, but there is no doubt that um, when the Western Europeans get into the habit of discussing political matters from the point of view of the group, and the group only, enormous progress will have been made. Take Vietnam. If there had been anything equivalent to a European political community in 1954 or 1955 and subsequently, it seems most unlikely that the United States would have taken the various steps that she did take. Or alternatively, that had they been taken, they might have been some indication of the extent and nature of European support. Equally, as the situation in Europe developed and its relationship with the Soviet Union and in, the, in its relationship with the Soviet Union, the United States might have had much less difficulty in taking her allies into her confidence and not, from time to time, uh, taking decisions which, however sensible, came rather in the nature of a shock to her allies. Sometimes one hears reproaches on the side of the Atlantic as regards the lack of support of America by her European allies, and notably by Britain. Now, if you consider the circumstances and past events, you may understand why the British take this a little hard. Until quite recently, indeed, American policy was largely concerned with inducing my country to abandon any imperial pretensions, to grant absolute independence to any dependent territories, irrespective of their apparent fitness for independence in our rather harsh modern world, and generally, we understood to concentrate on Europe. Anyone who heard President Roosevelt trying to curry favor with Stalin on colonial questions at Churchill's expense at Yalta, as I did, will appreciate the length to which this policy was carried. Well, now that Britain has fully accepted American advice by divesting herself of any imperial responsibility, whatever, by reducing the Commonwealth to a sort of friendly society, by relinquishing her world mission, and by basing her entire foreign policy on the prospect of entering the European Economic Community, she is, however, told by some that she is abandoning her responsibilities and sinking to the level of a third-rate power. Well, that may be so, but you can't have it both ways. Actually, I think the British weakness, whether physical or financial, is being considerably exaggerated, to say the least, abroad. But anyhow, for better or for worse, there is now only one world power in existence, that is to say, one power which really can exert military pressure anywhere in the world if it wants to, and that power is you, is America. Well, this digression is merely designed to show that if America wants this burden, her burden, to be shared, there is in practice only one way to achieve this purpose, and that is to do everything possible to facilitate the necessary enlargement and the constitution of the European communities and the European political community. And though this may take time, and though obviously the operation must be conducted with tact and care, there is, I assure you, there is no other way. How indeed could the general cause of peace be furthered by, uh, for instance, the establishment of some virtual French empire in Western Europe? There is no doubt that um, such a creation would be an unstable factor, uh, since its one object, as, uh, as explained in the girl's memoirs himself, its main one object would be to throw itself now on one side and now on the other to obtain the maximum power and influence for itself. 
Nor would it be much better if the European Economic Community became only a sort of nominal union, Britain still being excluded and possibly expected to join some North Atlantic free trade area. For then the German problem would indeed become difficult to handle, except, no doubt, uh, on Russian lines. While it is also hard to see how the proposed free trade area could be constituted, given the obvious reluctance of Congress here to agree to the admission duty-free of great quantities of cheap British goods that would compete with local products, uh, to say nothing of a certain reluctance by Britain uh, to contemplate the virtual takeover of our so-called sophisticated industries by American companies. How, frankly, would it be anything save disastrous uh, if pro-Soviet governments came into power in the various countries of a disunited Western Europe, which, if Britain is left for long knocking at the door, is, uh, after the disappearance of the general, by no means impossible. No. If the problem of Europe is the problem of Germany, the problem of the Atlantic world is the problem of Britain. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in my search for peace, I have now uh, pretty well surveyed the world from China to Peru, as they say. What conclusion can, we, can be drawn from the known facts as regards the possibility of peace under our original definition? Uh, I suggest the following. One, for so long as men are men, some form of struggle between organized groups is unavoidable. The troubles of our proud and angry dust are from eternity and shall not fail, as the poet said. Nevertheless, the balance of terror, for so long as it exists, is a powerful factor tending to limit such struggles, whether they take the form of civil or international wars or even, God forbid, widespread anarchy. But if this major deterrent is to work at all, it is essential that the Americans and the Russians should increasingly come together. First of all, by signing the treaty and ratifying the treaty of non-proliferation, nuclear non-proliferation, and then in other similar fields. To this end, it is clearly in the interest of both superpowers that the Vietnam War should shortly end. This is on the assumption, which is probably legitimate, that the Soviet government will increasingly pursue a national rather than ideological foreign policy and indeed, this is precisely what the present Russian row with China seems to be chiefly about. Two, but in addition to encouraging such an extension of superpower relationships, we should all try uh, to curb the inevitable excesses of unrestrained nationalism by working for wider groupings wherever we possibly can. I don't say this will be easy. All I say is that the greater the number of such groupings, however elementary or embryonic, the greater the likelihood that local wars and struggles will be nipped in the bud. It will not be easy because, um, for the many reasons given by Professor Raymond Aron, a great French philosopher, in his tremendous work entitled War and Peace, which has at long last now, I think, been translated into English, which again I urge you to read, for the reasons given by him, the nation-state, uh, as I myself said, I think, in an article in the spring of 1966 issue of Daedalus, the Harvard magazine, I said is, is the nation-state is still the only unit in international relations which has any real political as opposed to economic significance. That is so. It will not be easy because, as I said before, there is still a tendency towards fragmentation in many parts of the world. But it remains an essential objective, if only because any other solution is fraught with terrible dangers. I may be accused of having a parochial outlook and of being insufficiently conscious of the great problems that confront the United States in the Far East, for instance, the problem of the future of Japan and the looming issue of China. I hope not. But I believe myself that the future of this country, the United States, will largely depend on whether or not Britain eventually succeeds in her attempt to enter the common market. And I would here only add this. I doubt very much whether it would be wise for the United States to enter into any serious relationship with the present European economic community, which, as I have said, cannot now function properly, owing to the refusal of France to abide by the Treaty of Rome and by the continued exclusion of Britain. 
For if this were done, it would simply help to perpetuate our exclusion and assist the general in his wicked ways. Much better make it clear that the United States simply does not believe that the present community will survive unless it grasps and copes with the two outstanding nettles, namely British membership and the maintenance of the supranational principle. Well, the third conclusion, I would say, is that um, pending progress in uh, the two main directions, we should all certainly do well to preserve existing organizations, and notably that of the North Atlantic Group. It is quite true that in present circumstances this cannot work as it should work, but if you read the papers covering what is known as the recent Hamel exercise, H-A-I-M-E-L, Foreign Minister of Belgium, you will see that much can be done in the way of improving consultations and in adapting the alliance from one which is purely military and defensive to one which is also geared to developing any chances there may be of exploiting the present detente or so-called detente in East-West relations. But in so doing, we should never forget that there are still 22 Soviet divisions in Eastern Germany, all fully equipped with the latest weapons, and that the spearhead of these divisions is only 100 miles from the Rhine. And fourthly, while realizing that the United Nations has in itself, as I said, very little power to decide the great issues of peace and war, we should nevertheless not become too impatient with the functioning of the General Assembly and the Security Council. At the moment, the United Nations is neither a world government nor a world authority, nor is it likely to develop into either the one or the other for a long period of time. But it will be evident from my general analysis that I see it developing eventually more on the lines of the second and the first, that is to say more on the lines of an authority than in the lines of a world government. If there is anything in my general approach, it follows that towards the end of the century, perhaps, the world will have settled down into a number of regions of which the most easily discernible now are North America, perhaps, and no doubt also Australia, Australasia, Europe, the Soviet Union and certain dependencies, China, and perhaps also Japan. We must also hope that India will avoid anarchy and join the company. Perhaps there might even be a reconstituted Raj. Other possible regions, of course, are South America, the Middle East, or the Islamic world, Southeast Asia, and Africa, south of the Sahara. But all these are much more shadowy at present. In any case, the idea would be for each region to be represented in the Security Council by one member. And ideally, there would be some kind of majority voting in that body, in principle. All disputes between members of the region themselves should be settled in and by the region, whereas inter-regional disputes would be settled by the Security Council. In this way, there would be no need for a General Assembly at all. The whole system would represent a, wherefore, a world authority, not a world government, but a world authority. World government, that is to say a centre in which actual decisions relating to the administration of all the inhabitants of the globe could, as I see it, only come very much later if it ever came at all, which I rather doubt. The novelist and the philosopher George Orwell, who wrote 1984, I remember, who was at my school and indeed an acquaintance of mine, had, of course, um, a not dissimilar, not dissimilar vision of the future of the world from the structural point of view, though he was much more pessimistic uh, than I am about its actual operation. Once you have your great regions, it is surely unnecessary to assume, as he did, that they would be run by totally inhuman sub-men and be in a permanent state of conventional war with each other, with the sole object of keeping down the standard of living of their peoples, subjecting them to perpetual war hysteria, and above all, maintaining the rulers in office. Once you have solved the problem of the relationship of power to growth, you might indeed be entering into an altogether more happy stage in the development of the human race. Some contend that institutions matter little, and that all depends on the mood of the rulers, which, since men are men, will vary from year to year, or indeed generate from generation to generation. I am not so sure. The institutions and the customs of China 
and indeed of the Roman Empire, had a vastly good effect. And they survived all sorts of uh, upsets and barbarian incursions. It is for their successor, which for want of a better word we call Western civilization or sometimes Faustian man, it is now clearly, clearly entering into a kind of world phase to establish some sort of machine which will be used as well by all those who, whether they know it or not, have now absorbed and who are now largely putting into practice Western methods and conceptions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope indeed I believe that we shall, in a world society made increasingly interdependent, if not one, by modern inventions, all traverse this phase without major hostility, certainly without large-scale racial wars as predicted by some. So no doubt, with an abundance of revolutions, civil wars, economic crises, and even, I get to say, sometimes major famines. But I also think that if we are to come through in this way, great patience and courage will be necessary on the part of our rulers, and much the strength and refusal to get excited on the part of all of us. Surely we can reflect, even when our passions are most aroused, that if history shows anything, it is that the enemies of the day are very often the friends of tomorrow. And the great thing is to work towards the belief in some kind of authority, so that it is ultimately authority which produces fear, and fear is the chief enemy of peace under any definition. I have tried to say why I believe that peace is possible, even if only an imperfect peace. My ideas may be impracticable. But if they are, it is very interesting to hear counter-proposals which make some sort of intellectual sense and cannot simply be dismissed as workable thinking. Do not let us in any case succumb to the feeling that things have now got out of hand and that there is nothing that the ordinary citizen can do about it. We are, indeed in the light of events we must be, much more sceptical than the previous generation as regards the immediate prospect of getting some effective machine for generating world peace. But that does not mean that we should not seek to make the best use of that which now exists. In the great words of Matthew Arnold, the cause thou must not dream, thou needst not then despair. Let me add just one word if I have another minute. As an Englishman, I'm speaking in America in these critical and dangerous days. I ask you to believe that there is a great deal of sympathy in my country for Americans in the rather tragic situation in which they find themselves. Nor is there any general disposition to blame the United States or to suggest that the Viet Cong or anything but dangerous enemies of any kind of free society. It is quite true that many British, I say many British, hold the view, which after all, as I understand it, is widely shared here by some and not by all, but it is a case of the wrong war and the wrong place and the wrong time. Nor, since they were not consulted about its origin and extension, do they, the British, feel under any obligation to assist their ally in any physical way, and this is surely natural. But while they well understand the motives of the Americans in taking the stand they have taken, they are frankly alarmed. Lest you should either escalate the war, as it's called, or decide clear out of Vietnam altogether. It is not for us to give advice, but we can, I suppose, be committed to express a hope. And that hope is that, calm and undisturbed, the world's greatest power will continue to back the free world and will not be dismayed by the criticism, the jealousies, and the frank animosities to which leadership, I assure you, must give rise. It is not fashionable nowadays to speak of any continuing special relationship between Britain and America, nor in fact does it exist. But what can be said is that if only as a result of a common language and a common historical development, our two countries are more likely to understand each other than any other two, and that basically the misfortunes of the one are regarded and felt as the misfortunes of the one or the other. And so far as we can, therefore, let us resolutely move towards the unseen together. Thank you.